Hi there, I'm Shane. In this video, I'm going to go over the very fundamentals of how to operate your mirrorless camera by using manual mode, specifically how to dial in your shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. This video is part of a series I've been working on teaching the very basics of photography for beginners on mirrorless cameras. And if you're interested in learning more or seeing videos about sensors, lenses, macro photography, I'll have a link on screen now to a playlist with more videos that I've made. However, this video is going to be focusing on the very fundamentals and all you'll need is a camera with a lens on it. If you have a choice of lens, I'd highly recommend using a prime lens like a 35, 30, or 50 millimeter lens, but realistically anything will do. And if your camera can't change lenses or you just have the kit lens, that's absolutely okay. Anything will work for this video. Let's get right into it though. I'm gonna be talking about how to dial in your shutter speed, aperture, and ISO in order to properly expose your image and get the creative vision you're looking for. And these might've been words you've heard before or be complete gibberish. In this video is going to dive into each setting discussing how they can affect your image and ultimately how to dial them in in order to get the certain look you're looking for and have creative control over your photography. First up is shutter speed and it's the mechanism that opens and closes in order to let light through to your camera sensor. And that very typical camera click that you always hear is the shutter and it's measured in seconds. So if I have a shutter speed of one one thousandth of a second, it leaves very little time for light to pass through and hit the camera sensor and it will result in a darker image. However, if I have a shutter speed of one tenth of a second, it allows a lot more light to pass through in that time period and will result in a brighter image. Besides affecting how bright or dark an image is, shutter speed also affects motion blur. And thankfully, this concept is rather simple again, and that is that things move. So if I use a fast shutter speed, it gives less opportunity for things to move while I'm taking the image, whereas a longer shutter speed can allow time for things to move across frame or for your hand movement to introduce some blurriness to the image. This is very easy to see when taking photos of fast subjects like dogs, where you'll need to use a fast shutter speed in order to make sure that they're crisp in the image, whereas a slower shutter speed just results in a rather blurry mess. And this is also especially noticeable late at night when you want to use a shutter speed in order to properly expose your image. However, often if you're taking handheld photos, they'll appear blurry just because your hand movement is causing some shake. This is why people use tripods and I'll talk more about it later in the video. I'll move on now to the concept of aperture. Your aperture or iris is the hole inside of your lens made up of teeny blades that can be made larger or smaller in order to let more or less light through to your camera sensor. When looking at the numbers though, it gets a little bit more complicated because it's typically measured in f-stops, which is actually a ratio. So if you have an f-stop of f1.8, that's a very large hole for it to let light through, which means you get a brighter image whereas an aperture of f11 will be a much darker image and let much less light through to the camera sensor. However, your aperture is responsible for much more than just how bright or dark an image is. It also controls your depth of field or how much of an image is in focus. And this is a very complex topic, really deserving of its own video. But to keep it simple, a smaller hole in your lens or an aperture of like f11 will result in much more of the image being in focus. Whereas an aperture of around f1.8, which is a very large hole in your lens, will result in a much shallower depth of field, meaning your background can be very blurry and get that coveted bokeh a lot of people are looking for. And when you're first getting started, this is one of the most fun settings to really play around with because it kind of gets that typical high-end looking photo. So. It's a very complex topic, but also very fun to play around with. The last major setting I'm going to discuss is your ISO. And thankfully, this is probably the easiest one to understand. I find it's easiest to think of it as the sensitivity of your camera sensor. And the lower the number is, the darker the image is. And the higher you go, the brighter the image becomes. Most cameras have a base ISO of 100. So if you have an ISO of 1000, it's going to be significantly brighter 
and then ISO 100 and you just keep working your way up and you get brighter photos. The catch is though, the higher you go with your ISO, the lower your image quality becomes and at high ISOs, there can be some digital noise and lower color fidelity that appears in images. So generally speaking, you're best off keeping your ISO as low as possible. However, if you need to adjust your aperture and your shutter speed, your ISO is there to compensate for them. So sometimes you want to take a photo and you just have to bring your ISO up in order to get the image you want. And that's okay. It's just important to be mindful that the higher the ISO is, the lower the image quality becomes. So now that I briefly discuss what each of these settings controls, it's time to discuss how they all interact. In overall, all photography is, is a giant game of compromise, and you adjust each setting in order to compensate for what the other setting is doing. And by combining these settings in unique ways, whether it be your shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, you can radically change how an image is gonna look. So let's say I wanna take a portrait of a friend of mine, and I wanna get a blurry background to the image. I know I'm gonna focus on what my aperture is, and I'm gonna start off by using the lowest aperture that I can, which with this lens is f1.8. So this is gonna result in a very large hole in the lens, allowing a lot of light in. So in order to compensate for this, I'm gonna to have to use a relatively fast shutter speed and have my ISO set as low as possible in order to still get an exposed image. Let's move on to a more dynamic subject now though, like dogs. They rarely like to stay still. So I know I'm gonna to have to use a fast shutter speed, otherwise my images are gonna turn out rather blurry. So I'll start off with a shutter speed of one one thousandth of a second. I kind of want to bring my aperture up a little bit, otherwise my depth of field is going to be rather shallow, so I'll use an aperture of, say, f2.8. Now my images are going to be rather dark, so I'll bump up my ISO in order to compensate for my relatively dark shutter speed and aperture. And this will result in a rather crisp image with a little bit of noise, but at least it's in focus. Say though, you don't really like people and you don't care for photos with blurry backgrounds, you're all about landscapes, and I am too, so let's talk about that. Often with landscapes, the main focus is image quality and a very deep depth of field. So we're gonna focus on first our aperture. We're gonna want it relatively high with an aperture of say f11. And we wanna keep the ISO as low as possible to have as minimal grain in the image if we wanna print this off very large. However, the setting that's gonna suffer then is our shutter speed. And we're gonna to have to have a relatively long shutter speed, like at least about one tenth of a second, if not longer. So if we were to try and take this photo while handheld, it'll probably result in a blurry image. So in order to compensate for that, we're gonna use a tripod and we can use a shutter delay or a remote release in order to make sure we're not causing the image to be blurry by touching the camera. There's a lot of concepts I'm glossing over here though, like hyperfocal distance, the use of filters in order to get longer exposures, and much, much more. But really just the focus of this video is just all about getting the right exposure. And all these examples I used are all rather ideal situations. However, when you're first getting started, I highly recommend trying to work in as controlled and slow paced environment as you can, such as going to the park with a friend and just taking photos of them or taking your camera out and just getting photos around the house. Because regardless of how low stress the environment is, shooting in manual mode at the start can be a rather daunting task. And the only way to get better is just to practice because when you wanna use your camera in a more high stress situation, you're gonna to wanna to be able to dial in your settings relatively quickly and know what the right thing to adjust is to get the look you're going for. Regardless of how good you get at dialing in your settings, there's always gonna be situations where using automatic modes is the better choice. And I often end up using aperture or shutter priority mode with auto ISO, depending on the situation I'm in. The reason I recommend using manual mode while you're getting started though is because unless you know what your settings are controlling, you won't know when they're limiting you or getting you a lower quality photo. And it's going to help you build good habits so that when you do need to actually shoot in manual mode, you'll be quick and able to get the photos you're looking for.
This video was just covering the very basics though, and I hope to expand on all these topics in future videos down the road. However, if you have any questions on anything I said, or you want me to elaborate on anything, please feel free to leave a comment below and I'd love to help. And I'll have a few videos linked on screen now to other videos I've made that I think you might find useful. Anyways, thanks again for watching. I hope you have a fantastic day and I'll see you in the next video.